All right, we have an infinite square well problem where we need to find out various physical quantities about the wave function in that infinite square well. So just looking at the infinite square well in the first place, um, it has a couple of allowed modes. So for the first energy level, it's going to look something like this. For the second energy level, it looks something like this. The third looks like this. And uh, they kind of keep going like this, um, kind of similar to previous physics classes with standing waves and for our first quantity whenever we think about the expectation value of x or the average value or the average position of the wave function in respect to x it's always good to start these problems with some sort of idea of um, some sort of qualitative answer so the average position in respect to x since the wave function itself these wave functions represents the uh, probability distribution of the um, <clears throat> of the wave function and where it exists between zero and a or the width of the infinite square well we see that there is a equal distribution of the wave function on this side as on this side and same thing with this side and this side and this side has an equal distribution as this side so we know that the average value is probably going to be smack dab right here in the middle and honestly, for a lot of classes and instructors, this is probably the uh, enough to be like a good answer just qualitatively because that involves more physics than it does necessarily math, which is the reason why you're a physics student probably. But <clears throat> you can also do this using uh, the integral, and it's probably just good practice to do the integral. So whenever you do the expectation value, it's always the... Uh, integral from over all space so negative infinity to positive infinity and then that value that was uh, we're trying to find the expectation value is that operator and then uh, times the wave function the magnitude of the wave function squared and so far the infinite square well it's the uh, square root of two over the width of the square of the infinite square well and in our case it's a and then times sine of n pi x over a or the width of the square well modular scared in respect to space. In this case, we ours is only in the x direction here. <clears throat> so this one's not too bad of an integral to solve using integration by parts. You can use that. You can use this quantity and just change the limits. And then, or you can look it up a table or use the calculator. Uh, I personally prefer uh, qualitative first and then uh, calculator, then table, and then doing it by hand because that's physics. But either way, uh, no matter what you're going to, no matter which way you're going to do it, you're going to end up finding that it actually agrees with our physical interpretation here. So the next physical property that we're looking for is the expectation value of x squared. This one doesn't have a really good physics uh, shortcut. So we just set up the integral this way with our uh, value that we're trying to find the expectation value of. And then our wave function squared. respect to x and again uh, there's not a good shortcut to this one so i would recommend using this as let's say as our as our y for integration by parts and then solving it that way or using a calculator um, for the sake of this video i'm not going to go into the details but the answer you should be getting will look something like this one third and there's not a great this this answer actually doesn't provide a whole lot of uh, detail of the of what's go physically like what's going on uh, except for one quality if we look back up at the expectation value of x you notice that there's no n here which makes sense because what we talked about was no matter what our wave function was no matter what different energy level that we used here the expectation value was always smack dab in the center but that's not necessarily the case with x squared because we have an n in the answer here for the expectation value so uh, the, it does change whenever you find or um, based off the energy level for the uh, expectation value of x squared so we're going to move on to our next uh, physical quantity and involves momentum <clears throat> this one's a little bit more fun uh, in terms of physical intuition so the momentum value if we'll go ahead and let me just go ahead and redraw a crude infinite square well here so for this infinite, for inside the infinite square well, uh, it has a 
a chance to have a magnitude and direction of having a velocity going this way, and it also has an equal and opposite chance of having a um, velocity going in the opposite direction in the same way, or in the opposite way. So whenever we find out the average value of the momentum, which since our particle is not changing mass, it's really just the average value of, of velocity, but so it has an equal chance of pointing this way in that direct in, in that magnitude, and an equal probability of pointing that direction with the same magnitude. So the average value is actually going to be zero, and that's the physical, the qualitative idea of trying to uh, figure out these answers. But um, the next step in actually doing it in more of a uh, quantitative way is our classical in our classical way of finding the. Uh, the momentum, which is mass times the derivative in respect to time of the uh, expectation value of x. And since our expectation value of x, is, as we found, was just a constant, the time derivative of the constant is just going to be zero. And again, we could be we could go back up and, and do like the big integral too, but we're just going to do that uh, for the next quantity anyways. So it would even it's better just to stick with just the equality qualitative answer here. So the next quantity is the momentum squared that we're going to find. And this one doesn't have, like the others, doesn't have a great physical uh, qualitative shortcut. But it's always good to get the practice of actually you know, doing these integrals because this one actually provides pretty good insight. So the momentum operator the quantum momentum operator is h-bar squared over the spatial derivative, dx. And since it's the momentum squared, we're actually... So that's going to be squared. And then times our wave function. And I'm just going to write the general wave function or, uh, as a function of x as a psi sub n, depending on the energy level, um, dx. Right? So... Just in general, in case uh, you didn't catch this in the lecture, this is uh, always some operator. So this is the operator acting on the magnitude squared of the wave function, right? And this is always equal to, another way to write this is the, um, the complex conjugate of the wave function. And then slam in the operator against the uh, the normal form of the wave function. So whenever you do this, you can just sandwich that operator between the wave function and the complex conjugate where the operator itself only acts on the normal form of the wave function here. So we'll go ahead and rewrite this. We'll rewrite this in terms of this stuff over here. And I'll just keep the wave function in general terms. It'll make more sense after this step. So we have our integral over all space and then we have the complex conjugate of our wave function i'll just keep it size sub n i won't write it in terms of x uh, size sub n complex conjugate and then with our uh it has our we have our um, actually i'm gonna split up our operator here so i'm gonna square that separately so since this is a constant it can actually move out of the actually, I'll just go ahead and do that now. It can, it can move out of the integral. Make some space here. There we go. So it can move out of the integral, but we still have our spatial deriv derivative that we originally had. So it's the second derivative in respect to um, in respect to x. So we'll just say it go went ahead and operated on the uh, the wave function. And that's all in respect to x. Now, if you recall, which is a, a you typically a tall order <laughs> in lectures because there's just so much going on in, in quantum mechanics, but this is a good thing to have in your back pocket. The, the curvature or the second derivative of the wave function in respect to x is actually, for the infinite square well, is equal to 2me over... Uh, h-bar squared times psi. If you're wondering, like, where the crap did that happen, if you have the Schrodinger equation right here, and then you have a potential that equals zero, which is the only condition that it can have for the infinite square well because 
this is infinity, this is infinity, and this is the uh, potential equal to, ze uh, equal to zero. And if you solve for the second derivative of the uh, wave function of the Schrodinger equation, of the wave function for the Schrodinger equation, you're going to end up getting this. Um, so since we know that this curvature is equal to this, we can throw that back into our, um, uh, our integral right here, noting that these are all constants, so they can just move out and join these guys on the other side, leaving this uh, wave function behind. So we'll go ahead and rewrite that. We have our h bar squared over i squared. That's just going to turn into negative 1, but we'll just leave that there. And then all of our constants that we just had out here, I'll just throw a negative sign in front. And then our 2me over h bar squared. We can already see some things are going to cancel out. And then uh, we had our complex conjugate of the wave function. And then the only thing left in from this, from this uh, relation is just psi sub n dx. And as you can see, so this is just the, uh, this is just equal to one. It's the, it's the probability of finding the particle over all space. So the particle has got to exist somewhere. So this whole integral is equal to one. And then this is just a blob of constants that we can just go ahead and cancel a bunch of stuff out and it'll end up being 2m e sub n. Sorry, this is actually n because the, uh, um, the, the energy depends on what energy level we have. So this should be actually sub n's over here. But um, so just e to 2, 2m e sub n or... You can rewrite this as uh, n pi h bar over a, the width of the infinite square well, squared. And again, you might be wondering where did that come from? So again, if you can, if you go back to the, the Schrodinger equation and you solve for the energy level, which is apparent in the, which is in the text, uh, you'll end up finding this relation here for the infinite square well only, right? And so what we just did was we just we just moved this over to this side, so that's just two m e, and then all that's left is over is this. And why would you want to get in this term? Is well because everything else that we solve for is also in terms of just n pi and a's. So whenever we move on to this next portion of the question, uh, it'll make things easier. So there you go. There's that answer, and moving on to the standard deviations. This is gonna go a little quicker. So we know that the standard deviation in respect to x can in general be uh, written as the expectation value of x squared minus the expectation of val value of x squared. Oops, square root, square rooting all of this. All right, um, there we go. Square rooting all that. So all we have to do is just use our values that we found uh, early up, earlier up in the um, earlier parts of the question and just plug them in and then just do some algebra. So I'll go ahead and write them out. So for the expectation value of x squared, we had uh, a times one or times quantity of one third minus one half and uh, n pi squared under one. And then our expectation value of x was just the middle value. So it's the, it's the expectation of value of x squared, so we just square that. And of course, square root all this. Uh, algebra happens and reveals something that's not necessarily uh, physically illuminating, but just a stepping stone for something that is in the next portion of the question. So this is our answer for the standard deviation of x. Now moving on to the 
standard deviation of momentum, standard deviation of momentum is going to follow the same uh, the same idea where it's the momentum squared, the expectation value of the momentum squared uh, minus the expectation value of momentum squared. All right. Let's make some room. So we'll throw in our physical quantities. So in terms of just the n pi's and the a's, uh, we found that this was actually n pi h bar squared, all that stuff squared. And then our average momentum, so since it was the particle was just basically bouncing back and forth inside the infinite square well, that was just equal to zero. So we'll just put that to zero. This is a pr pretty easy one to figure out. This is m pi h bar over a, right? So pretty easy answer to find here. Now we're going to be looking at something that's a little bit more physically illuminating. We got the uh, we got the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which I'm just going to put as HUP. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the uh, the uncertainty between these two, the momentum and the position, is always greater than or equal to h bar over two, right? So. We just since we just found these two physical qualities here, uh, we can go ahead and input those. So that since this was our um, position and this was our momentum values, we just multiply those two together. So let's see here. We got a over two. This is just for the uh, standard deviation with respect to x. So it's actually three. Three, uh, subtract by two over uh, quantity of n pi squared, square root, and then times our n pi a. There's a h bar in there too. Um, so if we just look at it, we got an n here, right? So our largest value we're gonna get for any of this stuff is since this n is squared down here, this one's not, the largest value you could possibly get uh, the largest uh, uncertainty we could possibly get is if n is equal to 1 because we want to make this squared denominator as uh, as small as possible. And the smallest we get is n equals 1. So for n equals 1, uh, we can go ahead and do some algebra. So this is always less than or equal to uh, pi after algebra happens. Uh, pi h bar 2, uh, 1 third. So off the bat, this doesn't really scream any cool physics uh, ideas or anything like that, but we'll take a look at it in a second. So if we go ahead and just calculate what this actually is, this is approximately like 1.14, right? So uh, whenever we, or well, whenever we include, include the, the pi as well, so... Since this is 1.14, so 1.14 times h bar over 2, that's always going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So even in the lowest energy of the infinite square well, the uncertainty between the two is always going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So for this problem, everything that we found checks out. It obeys the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and a lot of stuff physically makes sense, which is... Um, the whole point of the problem was to just to go through this exercise and, and just apply some qualitative and quantitative reasoning for the infinite square well.